Welcome to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. Each week, Matt, Kurt, Jerry, and the occasional special guest explore how the trauma informed paradigm challenges traditional beliefs and approaches concerning a wide variety of areas. This podcast addresses psychological trauma in an educational manner and is not designed to replace mental health treatment. If anything in this podcast makes you feel uncomfortable or anxious, please talk to a mental health professional. Welcome to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. Um, I'm Matt. I'm also here with my friends, Kurt and Jerry, again. Uh, so we've hit uh, uh, our eighth episode. Uh, well, we're going strong. And today, we, we want to shift our focus a little bit. When we started this podcast um, and decided on the name Trauma Informed Lens, one of the things that we really wanted to do was look at what's going on in our world um, and, and see what the trauma-informed paradigm can tell us about that. So all this neurobiology, most of our focus up to this point has been um, for for the people and services people we're working with, uh, kids in schools, um, from that service provision, educational sort of perspective. And and we want to kind of bring that um, into the current event realm this week. Um, There's been a lot um, when we talk about trauma happening in our world. Uh, the thing that uh, sort of inspired our thinking around this was the, the Me Too campaigns and all the, the sexual harassment um, and the trauma associated with that is, as these stories come out. And, and um, I think we've all probably heard, I know the three of us have, of people that we know um, in one way or the other who've experienced harassment, uh, sexual harassment in their own life. And Again, working in the field we do, it's, it's uh, sexual assault and other things are a big, powerful thing. Um, uh, with that, also terrorist attacks and, and other things has happened since we've made this decision as well. Just last night, there was um, a shooting here in Colorado at a Walmart. Um, so uh, again, it just seems like there's, there's so much trauma in the news right now. And so we're going to this week take a step back uh, sort of from, from the hardcore research and really start to apply some of what we've talked about so far to some of the uh, events that we see happening in the news. So, but before we get into that, as always, we want to talk about our bright, shiny objects of the week. If you're new to the podcast, this is just things that we're fascinated with and probably borderline obsessed with. Um, If you know the three of us, uh, that's not a hard thing for us to do. And so um, I'll start out this week. Uh, My bright, shiny object is... um, I, I was talking to Kurt here before the podcast as I watched my one baseball game of the year uh, last night. I, I have a rule that um, I'm not a huge baseball fan, but, you know, game seven of a World Series, uh, I, I just feel obligated uh, to watch that. And I was really happy to see uh, for my friends in Houston. I was kind of sad for my friends in L.A., uh, but I'm sure it's 70 degrees and sunny there today, so they'll be okay. But just really, I, I think sports plays such a fascinating role in our society um, and a part of our identity. I, I know growing up in Indiana and then being a Colts fan, moving out to Colorado where there's all these crazy Broncos fans who are just insane. Uh, you know, it, it's an interesting experience. And so, um, you know, I think last night was kind of cool because a town that uh, was devastated by, by the floods and the hurricanes, um, you know, got a little, uh, a big flood of dopamine and serotonin, and for a day or two, um, they, they can kind of escape into that celebration and good feeling. So uh, that's my bright, shiny object of the week. Kurt, what do you got? Along the same lines of what you were talking about with fans and sports, and one of the interesting things I've been reading a lot about, about lately is how we start thinking about who's an us and who's a them. Yeah. And how much that can generate some of these events that we're actually talking about, about how can people can become so isolated from uh, what are sometimes arbitrary us's and arbitrary them's and how our biology uh, contributes to that. So that's something I've been thinking a lot and reading a lot about and seeing, of course, every time you're, you, you start thinking about something, right, you expand your view and you start finding that it was there all along and you just couldn't see it. Yeah. Um, so I see I've been, I've been watching for that a lot. And in the positions that I'm in, I, I think I have an opportunity there to help people to recognize when we start getting into us and them thinking and how easy that is to do. I mean, there's some really cool literature about 
uh, even if, I mean, sometimes we, we very easily can get into us and them thinking around, along racial lines. Yeah. It, it can be as simple as putting your favorite team's hat on somebody, even of a different race, and they become an us then and not a yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, So some absolutely. simple and powerful things that can be done to um, use the, those, those aspects of our, our own biology and our own physiology to generate how we want things to be and how we want to treat each other. So that's something I've been thinking a lot about a lot. Absolutely. And such a fat, that, that's a podcast topic that, but uh, you know, and just how we're programmed in that way. And when we would this, the, our realization of un unconscious bias and a lot of other things I think are really powerful. If, if anybody's interested in the topic too, I've, I found a good podcast. Um, I think it's called them and us. It may be us and them, but I think it's them and us. And it's actually uh, done by West Virginia Public Radio. And um, it, they, with uh, Trump and all this stuff going on, they look at conservative and more liberal views um, within that really a more complex state than you would kind of think initially. And it, they do a really good job of taking on some of the big, you know, kind of divides in that. So just to throw that out there as a podcast that I've uh, I think I went back and listened to every one. It's one of those that you listen to one and uh, go back. Hopefully we'll get there at some point too. So Jerry, what do you got for us today? Well, I, I uh, think I joined both of you in, in thinking about some of these issues, especially with the World Series last night to kind of think about that. And um, speaking of sports, one of the things that um, caught my eye this week that I thought was really interesting um, that's related to the topic we're going to talk about today is Brianna Stewart, the uh, basketball player, the Olympic basketball star in basketball, who came out and talked about her history of sexual abuse. Um, and what was interesting to me is she talked about how, in a way, she compartmentalized those bad experiences that she didn't want to think about. And then she had this part of herself that um, was safe and competent and capable on the basketball court. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, how our, our, our minds um, and our bodies are able in some ways to think about trauma um, of putting it away that allows a piece of us to go on and function in life to do it. Um, and that strategy works really well until you have events that come up that make that much more difficult. Yeah. Um, and so she talked about um, in, in, in a really clear way, and I think that's helpful for a lot of the clients that I worked with um, who talked about this, about how the fear of kind of acknowledging that piece of her, it would become her. Yeah. Um, and so really the, the bravery that she took to kind of talk about it, but also the impact it has on her in terms of not her, um, you know, her wish to integrate, but her fear of disintegration yeah. um, that comes up. So I think we'll talk some about that today, but I wanted to kind of take my hat off to her for the courage that she showed and, um, and how important it is not for us just to hear about harassment, but to really hear from people who um, have in some ways overcome those experiences and um, have found a way to kind of uh, and to go on and, and function really well in, in life with them. Absolutely. And I think that in, to transition into our subject and as we, we sort of bring in this current event pr perspective is, you, you know, all the, the powerful and sometimes just absolutely disturbing um, stories that are coming out. And, and I've really paid attention. I, I've written a blog post or two on this, but it just seems like the amount of traumatic stories coming out uh, in the news lately just, just seems to overwhelm any, any sort of way to keep relevant sometimes on these topics. But, you know, when you've got people talking about um, – you know, sexual assault, uh, sexual harassment. Um, you know, I, I thought the Kevin Spacey thing was that was really powerful this week um, uh, with with uh, accusations of sexual assault on a child. Um, if we want to step back and call it what it really was, and and, and I've really asked people that that read the blog to really think about. 
And I, I want to kind of throw this out there as, as we sort of dig into this topic to both of you too and get your thoughts on it is every time you turn on the news, there's violence on the news. Um, and, and it's really, I, I think, what the, the sexual harassment stuff, um, which, which again, I, I'd almost like to call sexual assault because of how these things, I mean, these are some, I mean, it's one thing if, if and Kurt, this goes to the them and us thing we're talking about, if it's somebody I dislike, it's like, oh yeah, that guy's a creep anyway. But there are some guys that, I mean, I like Kevin Spacey as an actor in, until last week. Um, Mount Mark Halburn was a hard one for me. He was a political guy who I really respected um, his views. And the things that came out about him are just absolutely disgusting. Um, and, and so with all of this coming through and knowing that we, most of us listening to this <laughs> podcast um, have probably experienced some trauma in our own life, but work with folks that probably have unresolved trauma, just sort of um, in, any insight you have um, about how this may be impacting people in general and also a focus of those that, uh, that are struggling to overcome their trauma that, that are in our services and looking for us for help with this as well. You bring up, I think, a really pretty interesting point about how I, I I'm a, I may butcher this a little bit because uh, it, it's uh, a pretty complicated topic, I think, about how our, our brains are constantly searching and scanning the environment for what's the same and what's different. Yeah. And we very quickly uh, recognize what's different and try and assimilate it into what we know in our previous experience. And if it doesn't assimilate, we struggle with that. That, that yeah. creates some stress for us. And so as we think about, like you, you talk about somebody who you respected and you got new information about, it's a struggle to assimilate that new information with how you thought about that person, yeah. what your experience was with that person. And I think that on a moment to moment basis, we're all kind of struggling with those things at any given point in time. And that's just kind of the, uh, a, the nature of being a human. Yeah. And, and it's so interesting as I think, even when we compare ourselves to, um, uh, other species and how the brains of other species operate. One of the really interesting thing, things about humans is that we have the ability to contemplate our own existence mm -hmm. and to think about thinking. And, yeah. and it's amazing how useful that can be. And it's amazing how much of a struggle that can be at other times when we're faced with challenges of integrating new information and, and thinking about how that changes our, our previous experience and what we thought was true. Or uh, those are those really interesting topics to dive into, which is a, I mean, that's a whole area of yeah. to talk about it, which I think we're certainly finding with um, our, our episodes in this podcast. We can start out with a topic and boy, you can go 90 different directions really quickly Yeah, uh, because there's so much to talk about. And so it certainly is a challenge to kind of keep it into like, what are we going to talk about and how are we going to make this some sense of that? Yeah. Jerry, did I get the, 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 the brain function right with how I described that? Anything you'd add to that? You know, I, I, um, I, I'm sitting here and reflecting on what you both are saying, and, I, and I'm kind of thinking back to what I said about um, Brianna Stewart, about how she fragmented and she had this part of her that was well-functioning, but she has these other pieces. Some she can't remember. Some are, you know, her anger and rage, and some are um, her shame that kind of look at that. And then you think about Kevin Spacey about how he's fragmented, how he, how he has a piece that presents to the outside world than these others. And so when we begin to think about the us and the them, it's easy to kind of conceptualize that in the outside world, but it sounds like we also have that in our internal world. Yeah. There's this piece of me that I identify out to the world, and then there's this piece of me that I don't want to own or I don't want to see or I rationalize. Um, and so when they start to emerge, um, they create these kind of challenges for us. Um, how do we integrate our understanding of individuals? And I, and I think that, um, you know, you raise a, a really important point about assimilation. And that when we, when we think about what we want to call trauma, and I and I, and I think there is, a, there is a difference between somebody who feels harassed and feels competent and capable of engaging in a defensive, reactive strategy that they can get themselves out of them, and 
other people who feel helpless and powerless or fear loss of jobs or feel, there's a very different internal experience of not being able to kind of defend yourself and take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And when we're in those states in which our um, capacity to engage in escape behavior um, that allows us to feel a sense of agency that I'm in charge of my life and I can do some things. We have a high level of internal arousal combined with a sense of fear and terror. And no one likes to stay in that state. But that state, as you know, Jenea Fisher talks about, is we've got to find some way to manage that state. And so one of the ways that we do that is we engage in what go from freeze to collapse to submission. And then we start complying with what it is that is being asked of us as a way to minimize further in injury. Mm -hmm. Because if I can't get out is I'm going to comply. Well, then I comply and I have this intense sense of shame that goes along with that. So now not only do I have the original traumatic experience, but I have this intense feeling of shame um, and, and loathing for myself to kind of look at that I have to fragment off, that I can't in some ways live with and integrate. So in, so, in some ways, what we look at as symptomatic and painful internal states for our clients was really their way of, of in some ways trying to manage the situation that they had but now they get it disconnected when, when they can't talk about it with others. So now there's ruptures in their relationships that people can talk about. Now there's, I have this feeling of shame inside, but I have this feeling of anger and rage. I can't. Yeah, so I think we lost Jerry's audio there uh, Just for, for a, a second. Bit. <laughs> so he'll he'll come back here uh, but you know when we we look at this kurt you know uh, you know what what jerry was saying with with the shame piece i think is very powerful because you know as we look especially uh, with the weinstein issues and you know trauma is so often i mean with the exception of accidents and 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 a, a small section that usually you know uh, has impact but but also i think is is if it's an isolated event we can sort of recover from that maybe a little quicker is that that it's usually somebody or something with power um mm -hmm. that enacts that trauma upon someone else and, and that you know, dynamic, I think, is what's really playing out in, in an interesting way right now. And it's, it's interesting to watch for me, and I'd love to get your, your thoughts on this as well, is, um, you know, some of, some of the actresses that, that are coming out, you know, there's, there were the, the leaders that were coming out, the, the few that sort of took that initial stand and, and sort of opened the floodgates. Um, to, to the entire Me Too movement, but as, especially around uh, that particular individual. Um, but boy, you also see these other actresses who didn't speak out initially. And, and, and I hate to see that it's almost like, well, now they're carrying shame because they didn't do something sooner as well. So this, this I, I wonder from a behavioral perspective, um, since shame is such a big part of the, the trauma experience, and I think something like Jerry said that kind of stays with us um, sometimes for, for life if we don't get help, from a behavioral perspective, I just kind of wonder what are your thoughts um, around that, and is there any uh, things that, that you've seen that, that can sort of help people um, look at that in a light where, where they may be able to, to let go of some of that shame. Yeah, I, I was thinking and kind of take it back to, even back to our, our, a little bit of our discussion last week about how important it is to have attuned and attentive caregiver interactions early on in life. And that that is where, I think that power thing ties right back to that, that as infants, we're incredibly helpless and we're dependent upon 
another caregiver, somebody who is much more experienced than we are and can actually take care of us to survive. Yeah. And so that really, I think, generates this, why, why people in positions of power have such a responsibility and have such a disproportionately large impact on others is that is deeply ingrained in our survival as a species. So it's very yeah. functional for us for, to do that. I mean, Absolutely. You, anytime you're asking about like the behavioral perspective, really you're asking about the contextual functional perspective on things. And yeah. what, what does this, you know, what does this work? What does, how does this work for us? And how does, how does this maintain itself over time? So thinking about any, any, any ways that we can equalize some of those power relationships is, is quite important. And as you're asking what, you know, what can people do with some of that shame and with some of that guilt? I think um, this is a concept that Jerry was talking about as well, is that when we have the ability to make some agentic action to affect our environment and be able to either get out of a stressful situation or solve the problem, uh, those create really good, powerful experiences for human beings. They yeah. help us behaviorally, they help us psychologically. They help us in, in it's, you know, so many incredible ways that anything that we can do to create an environment in which somebody can feel safe to do that and, and, and be able to have that experience where they can take some action and it solves the problem or they can get out of the situation in a, in a way that um, doesn't require extreme coping strategies. Yeah. Uh, but we can certainly help with that. And the repetition of those experiences is really where the healing becomes. Great. Uh, really possible. And one of the things we used to talk a lot about is um, teaching a lot of classically trained clinical folks about the change moment and how we think about that from a behavioral perspective, right? Even if you're talking about it for yourself, when you think back on your own life about a time when you've created a change or made a change, it seems like a magical moment in time, yeah. right? Our experience of it is as a singular moment in time. But what it really is, is the cumulative effect of a whole bunch of experiences leading up to it. Mm -hmm. So it, even though the moment is, seems magical and it's right, it's a wonderfully powerful moment. Yeah. It is the effect of the repetition of many experiences leading up to it. Yeah. And that's really, I think, one of the blends between understanding a trauma-informed approach and blending that with a behavioral approach is a stable social environment is one that's characterized by positive repetitive experiences and creating in that environment is a very contextual perspective, a very functional perspective. Absolutely. So that certainly I think those things can help people with some of those feelings uh, right. over time. You know, you know, Matt, you raise a, a really important um, flip side to the concept of when things come out in the media like this, mm -hmm. right? Is that, um, so many of the clients that I treated, they get exposed to something that triggers an internal experience, but they're not, they're not yet in charge of that experience. Yeah. Um, and so, in, you know, in a way, trauma is a highly activated activation of the lower parts of the brain, right? Mm -hmm. The limbic system, the the, the, the regulatory, all the trauma responses are in the, in the brainstem. They're not, right? The cortex is being shut down. And so lots of these experiences related to what an event early on come back flooding in their bodies. And they don't necessarily have words for it. They don't necessarily have well-formulated memories for it. They don't necessarily have the capacity to make sense of it. So they have this internal state of fear and anxiety and mm -hmm. live it without it. And so you have some individuals where hearing this stuff in the news is an opportunity for them to share and get reconnected yeah. and to do it. You have others that hear these things in the news and it floods them and they become overwhelmed and it's not necessarily it's more of a re-traumatization as yeah. opposed to a pre-processing it. Yeah. So I think when we start to kind of say is, why does didn't, why didn't somebody come out and why doesn't somebody else come out, is really the process of, um, the process of healing from trauma is in some ways waking up 
the frontal cortex so that we could kind of take what's in our bodies and make some kind of narrative meaning to it that makes sense in our lives. And when these experiences get triggered for people and they still don't have that capacity, it's, it really becomes, I need to move into a defensive place as opposed to a reparative place. Yeah. And I think that um, that's a really important part for us as both as a society, because maybe I can't come out this time, but it becomes something I can work on in my therapy, or maybe yeah. I, beca- I begin to see somebody else who survived that gives me hope that something, but it's not, you know what, everybody who's traumatized comes out and says, okay, now that you've all can talk about this, I'm now healed. Right. That's a personal internal body experience that going back to what Kurt said requires the availability of a safe relational environment to allow that process to come. It's, it's empowerment rather than disempowerment. Yeah. And, and it, goes all, it goes all the way back to one of the first concepts we talked about, Jerry, I think it was you who said it, that you spent your career and dedicated your, most of your adult life to helping people get unstuck. And that that's where we kind of get to with these kinds of things, thinking as you were talking about, the news and, and a, you get a flow of information from the news, so to speak, and that that can, that's a, that can be a person getting new information and trying to assimilate it at any given point in time. And that can easily get somebody stuck just because you're trying to do the assimilation process and you, you may not even know it right. until you're stuck. And yeah. then and that is, uh, I think, something that I've taken even from, from our first podcast episode to integrate into my thinking of when, when do I get stuck in that way? And how do I help others when I see them get stuck to get unstuck and keep moving forward? Right. I had an experience this this past month um, that I think is really relevant to what we're talking about today. I have asthma, right? And I haven't had asthma attacks or for a long time, but I started, as you know, a couple of episodes ago, I couldn't even talk. And I saw So I went to the doctor And what um, my physician said, she told me that even though we don't see it and people don't react, there is particles from the fires in California floating in the air. Hmm. And because you have this sensitivity, your body reacts. But I didn't connect it all to the news and what was going on. I was, my body was just reacting and trying to defend itself from what it was experiencing. So I didn't say, oh, I'm having asthma. Oh, there's fires there, right? And I think that for some of our clients, the, the, the analogy is these things happen on TV and they don't make any connections. Their body starts right. reacting. They start having anxiety. They start having fears. They start, but they don't necessarily have the memories or connected to the experience. So they, so they feel anxiety. They feel fear. They feel scared. But they, there's, there's no narrative to connect it to that. Yeah. So when I went to the doctor, I said, oh, it makes total sense now that there's some connection between what's happening, I remember in the news, and what's happening in my body. And I think trauma victims are very, for some, seeing something is refreshing because it gives them a context to what's happening in their body. Yeah. For others, they still can't make sense of how what's, the story is related to pieces of themselves that they have fragmented off and can't really remember. And it becomes an an overwhelming experience of fear and terror all over again. Yeah. And and, and it's that that sort of, if if our audience is unfamiliar with the concept of of that re-traumatization, we've thrown that word around and, and, and just to put a a definition around that. And when, when at least I speak and feel free to, to add in here guys as well is, the re-traumatization is a pretty intense, overwhelming experience where we're bringing something in the environment triggers. And it doesn't, you know, the, the thing I've learned over the years as I've started to look for this, you know, it's weird what triggers re-traumatization. Um, I've had people later on when I've had a chance to really process with them, it was maybe a song they heard in somebody's office as they were walking by or a, a certain smell or a poster on the wall. Um, you know, but, but there's, when we talk about re-traumatization, there, there's enough about a stimulus in the environment 
to remind us and bring up those traumatic memories. And it, and it elicits a response very similar that we had um, when we experienced the trauma. I thought it was Judith Herman, um, who was an early teacher of mine. As soon as Jerry introduced me, uh, her work uh, came in. And, and I thought, I haven't seen a whole lot of authors talk about this since, but I thought she had an interesting thing, which I think is relative to our discussion as well, is that re-traumatization may be, and she wasn't concrete about it, a way if I'm re-experiencing it, it's an opportunity for me to gain control over my emotional reaction and uh, in other ways kind of go back over the trauma. Um, she's also very clear that within isolation outside a safe helping relationship, um, that that's really, really difficult to do and almost impossible to do on your own. But I thought that, you know, that these experiences we have um, are in some ways opportunities for insight and, and possibly gaining control over our emotional reaction, which I'd love to just get your guys' I've always loved that because it seems functional in, in, a, in a, a way that's very psychological, but I'd love to get your guys' opinion um, on her, her concept around re-traumatization as an opportunity. So, so Ruth Lanius, um, who's a research neuro, neuroscientist researcher on trauma, um, in, talks about different, different um, states of consciousness, right? And one of those states is time that we put things in time. And, and she distinguishes between re-experiencing on one end of the continuum of the time and intrusive recalling, mm. right? When we have an intrusive recalling, we have an opportunity to get some control over and kind of looking at it. If on the other end, I'm just having a re-experiencing and I'm not having a cognitive narrative to kind of go with, kind of do it, right? I'm back in time when the event happened, I'm not going to have a re-control. So in one situation, I'm re-traumatized by that. Mm -hmm. In another one, I have an opportunity to work with that. And, and um, Alexander um, McFarland talks about even in depression, people have intrusive recollections, right? Yeah, yeah. Losses. But in trauma, really, the, what distinguishes it for a lot of our clients is when they get those triggers, their body is back in time, re-experiencing that. And that's somewhat different, which is why so much of the work that has to be done is not a cognitive process. It occurs in people being able to do that, being aware of their bodies and, their, and reconnecting with their internal experience and be able to manage those states as opposed to having cognitive interventions to talk about what happened. We used yeah. to believe all you had to do is talk about what your experience is over and over again and, and it would extinguish it and you'd put it in. But now we know is that talking about it actually sometimes for people who can't manage their states actually makes it worse. Yeah. So I, I think that um, when we talk about re-traumatization, we have to distinguish, are, are you having a memory that you're just remembering something that's painful and doing and it's an opportunity to help you to process it? Yeah. Or are you actually back in that memory reliving it where me helping you talk about that is really not going to help you. It's about me right. helping you manage the internal state you're experiencing. Absolutely. I and, was thinking about yeah. um, the, is a, I'm trying to just to describe a, a study that Jerry, I've talked to you about before, Matt, I've probably talked to you about it as well, about how the connections between the medial prefrontal cortex and how that's mediated by our connections to the limbic system, mm -hmm. and that that is then also mediated by a connection to our cardiac system, our cardiovascular system. Yeah. And that you really have two kind of ways that you can manage feelings and really use your prefrontal cortex to inhibit lower areas of the brain. And then you can have some, some cardiac markers for that. And the, those two methods are either suppression or reappraisal. Mm -hmm. so I can think about it differently and, and give new meaning to it or think about another perspective on something. And that's the reappraisal process. And the other is I can suppress it. 
which only works for a short period of time. You can't do yeah. that for forever. And as you're talking, Jerry, I think there, that you're, you've described two processes where in one, you can do suppression and reappraisal. Those are an option to you. And in the other, they are not. And if you're going through a real re-traumatization and your, your body is there in that, if that's the re-experiencing phenomena, that in that moment, reappraisal and suppression are not an option. They're not available to you. If you're going through an intrusive memory, you may have those options available to you. Right. And that I think is, is borne out in what, in, in what you described as our thinking used to be that if you talked about it enough, right, it, even from a behavioral perspective, yeah. you could extinguish that response, that conditioned response, right? Um, and we find out that that doesn't really work that well with that. Right? If, the, if suppression and reappraisal are not a, an option for you, it doesn't work. But if they are, then we should use those options and, and, and be a good therapist and know that those options are available to you. Right, right. Well, and just, I, I, I always like with one of my big insights uh, with re-traumatization too is, and this is a little heartbreaking for me uh, as somebody who's a lot of times been running programs and deciding whether uh, adults or, or even children at times is there behavior in a place where they can actually be in the program at the time? I'm a guy that had to kick people out of programs because their behaviors made it unsafe for everybody. And I look back at so many of those behaviors and I see them now as, you know, re-traumatization. Is that the, the, these illogical, again, as we talked about in the first episode, none of them woke up in the morning to say, I'm going to get kicked out of mass housing program today. Um, but so many of these behaviors are there, there's something in the environment that elicited this extreme, and from an outside perspective, if you're not educated on it, using the trauma-informed lens, so to speak, um, seems illogical. And it just, I just kind of wonder how many people are in prison because of re-traumatization, that, that somebody in a uniform comes up and from whatever their past experience is, comes out how many kids get suspended from school because of re-traumatization is they didn't just wake up in the morning and say I'm gonna throw my books at my teacher today but something happened in that environment that elicits that response and then you know again at the extreme end of it with, with a lot of the folks we work with there's there's a loss of control when that happens as well and then we go back to the shame and the guilt um, that's often experienced afterwards as well. And it's just, it really helped me gain empathy. Uh, didn't make my job any easier necessarily because I still had to manage the safety of the whole milieu or, or physical space. But at least I, I could separate the behavior um, from who that person is. That, that this is somebody who's been really hurt and, and that can explain a lot, not all, but I would say a lot of the behavior that, that we see coming through um, that, that hurts people's ability to stay in our, our programs at times even yeah i mean those are those are concepts i think matt what you're describing are the concepts of habits and reenactment yeah, yeah. That, that we get into patterns and our urge to repeat those patterns as as an organism is really really strong yeah as you think about i mean the, my great example i like to use is i, I tell people don't think about rabbits what are you thinking about <laughs> rabbits like even bringing it up means yeah. that like you get yes. we get into these patterns very very quickly, and our urge to repeat them is very very strong. It's incredibly adaptive, right? If something worked one time, great, yeah, do it again. And yeah. you know, our brains do that, and they're always ser searching for shortcuts, right? Doing new things is incredibly metabolically expensive. Yeah. So for us to develop habits has been really really great for us as a species. It's great yeah. for every other species to do that as well. If something works, let's do it twice, do it three times. And the more we do it, the more ingrained it gets. And those are almost always short term. They're almost always functional in the short term. Yeah. Even if they create problems down the road. Exactly. And I mean, that's one of the classic problems of human existence is responding to immediate consequences versus delayed consequences. Yes. It's the great test of the marshmallow study, right? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Best predictor of children's success is can you wait for two marshmallows later as opposed to taking the one now? Yes. Uh, those are some of the, the real challenges of human existence, I think, that 
we'll be struggling with that for forever, right? That's, those are just yeah. challenges. That well, are and I think it shows the, com- the complexity of working with individuals with, uh, who are, are struggling with trauma. I mean, again, as I, I tell people in my trainings, nothing I say today will make you think your job's easier. Um, I, I think it somewhat shows the complexity because we're asking people who also may be feeling unsafe because of the re-experiencing that's going on to, to stay calm, to stay in their prefrontal cortex, regulate their limbic system, and think at a higher level than just, I need to survive this situation and keep everybody safe, which is obviously the immediate response. But, but again, it, it shows the complexity of, of the, the human condition, especially as it relates to trauma. I'm pulling it even all the way back to um, the the sexual harassment topic, right? And yeah. the question in, say, for Hollywood, for example, is how do you change this culture? Yeah. And that question may be related to how do we create um, some rules or some guidelines or something that we talk about in this culture to change our experience of it? Yeah. Of how people who are in lower positions of power, say actors and actresses, which is yeah. kind of hard for me to think about an actor and an actress in a low position of power, yes. right? Yes. But there are people who have more power than they do. Yes. And how do, we, how do we create an environment in which the people who have power use it for the good of those who have less? Yeah. And that's really quite a, quite a big challenge to, to undertake. Yeah. Well, and and did this look like, again, as a non-Hollywood insider, which you can't get much non-Hollywood insider than me, um, it looked like this was like a a known thing. Like this wasn't like a secret, though it it hadn't sort of been outed in the way that it has recently. And I I just, I I see here, and I don't know if I'm going to formulate this question really well, but I, I see here not as worried about, and, and I, I care about them and I have empathy for them, so, so don't get me wrong that I don't care at all about the actors and actresses, but it seems like the people that have maybe 10,000 Twitter followers, they can come out in a certain way that all of a sudden there's some safety and security that now 10,000 and then 100,000, I mean, pretty quickly, everybody knows they've had this experience. I think the the Kevin Spacey thing is a, you know, here's someone with a following or a a sort of platform to get what happened to him out in a very powerful way. Um, I I just, I'm I'm worried about, you know, and I I think we've shared this in different ways and and I want to make sure we we hold confidentiality for people that have shared their experiences with us. But what if there's a teacher that's experiencing it at at her school? What if there's a nurse? I mean, and, and, and there's, harassment in the workplace that's not sexual harassment that, that it's just almost emotional if not borderline physical uh, abuse at times and I just kind of wonder if, if you don't have that sort of natural social media power and you may even be working in an area that if you come out and challenge your boss you can't find employment in the city that you live in um, how, how do you any suggestions for for folks in some of those hard sort of positions that they don't have the 10,000 Twitter followers and the national audience they can come up with. You you know, Matt, I I think it's, um, we should be very, very cautious to assess how much relational health is around somebody who has 10,000 Twitter followers. Good point. Yeah. you may be in a crowd of hundreds of thousands and be alone. Yeah. Or you may be with two people and feel very connected. Yeah. And I, and I think that, um, you know, in a way, we have a two-dimensional experience. That's why it, it freaks us out when we hear these things about their lives. It's like, yeah. right? It's like, who's this person? And, and so my, my sense of it is that, um, it goes along with all the things that we, one is, is you have to assess where I feel safe and who I feel safe with. And in that case, not to compare yourself to a movie actress who may be very, very alone. Yeah. Who may be very, very, feel like the only thing that I have is this two-dimensional people see about me. And if I give that up, there's nobody here. Mm-hmm. Right. As opposed to you, who's a teacher who have 
a lots of resources and lots of connections and feel how wealthy and rich you really are. Yeah. Right. And so I, I, I want us in, in some ways to empower everybody. Yeah. Is that one of the things Brianna Stewart did is she found a place where she found a sense of safety and competence. Yeah. And if you're a teacher and you're feeling like you're making a difference in the world, start from your place of strength. Start from where you feel really good about yourself, where it gives you a sense of um, value. And, and then identify that sense of power inside of yourself and connection, and then use that to build on, to be able to work on some of those areas that feel scarier, feel disconnected, and do it in the context of a relationship that could support you. Yeah. Um, you know, the media is great to kind of have this, but what we see is what, what pains me is I don't get to know what happens with Brianna. I mean, I, I, I sit and I worry about she came out and did this for everybody, but does she have the relational support to take care of her with the rest of the work that she needs to do? Yeah. Right? Is so people should kind of see these things in the news. And, and I think what Kurt said is great is how do we look at this as a society? What about our society allows these things to be known and not be shared? Yeah. How do we begin to create an opportunity for people to feel safe enough when they're ready to share, to share and know they'll be heard? Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we, in our own little, whether it be in our offices, whether it be in our relationships, when somebody's ready to come forward, I'll show up and be there for you to hear you and to kind of support you and to, and to kind of do it. And I think that really that's where the change in our society is. So many of these people walked around for so long both internally and externally thinking if I told on this person, they're never going to believe me. This yeah. person has so much power. Right. But when as a society, we kind of, uh, we kind of address the victims instead of the perpetrators, we, we begin to have a chance of changing some of these things. Beautifully said. I love, I love that piece of, of really, you know, again, the, 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 the victims uh, of being there, for them, and I just, you know, in a, at a time where I think we need to, to as people in, you know, and, and I, I hate the word victim, but if you've experienced trauma, you're a, you're a victim of something. Um, so again, it's not a weakness, that's just the reality of trauma. Um, and, and really, how do we create a collective voice for that experience, for people that may not be ready to get on Twitter and tweet out something that, that this is happening to them, um, I, I was in, and I, we've tried, um, which is sometimes difficult for us, but to be apolitical here, but even this week, I mean, you've got the president of the United States and his words on a consistent loop. And then from the White House podium, basically calling 16 people that have accused him of sexual harassment liars. And, and so that, that's what it is. I mean, we're not going to change that in the podcast, but mm -hmm. I, I think it does say how do people in social work and education and libraries find a collective voice to, to give voice for those that are having this experience who may not be ready to, to step out? And, and again, at the same time, helping them find their own strength and, and um, courage uh, uh, to leave the victim kind of behind. And, and like I said, I like to say, reclaim the hero uh, of the journey. And so it, it's a fascinating time to be having this discussion in, you know, that this, the, when we talk about this goes all the way up to, to the leader of our, the United States right now too. Kurt, well, you want to solve that for us in less than I, 10 minutes? I, I think Kurt could talk about this because I, I, I think what we need to do is, we all have experiences of being in places where we lost our voice. Yeah. We all have experience of places where we felt if we said something, something bad is going to happen, right? Yeah. And so in all of our lives, and, and Kurt knows we worked on this really in, in, a, in one of the places he was working, but how in your meetings do you make sure you give everybody a voice? How yeah. in your, right, is that these are the extremes, but really – how do I check myself and how I use power and how I use leadership? And am I in some ways because of my position, not creating an opportunity of space for people to say the things that they need to say. 
And I and Kurt, maybe you want to talk a little bit yeah, about. I mean, we were I was I, we were thinking the same thing. I think um, I, I was thinking about kind of a simple takeaway from we're all in positions where we have more power than others, and we're in situations where we have less power. That's the nature of our society, and yeah. that's the nature of being a person. And I think um, something I've learned a lot about being in those positions is that when you are in a position of greater power or even equal power with people be the more curious one. Mm -hmm. you really, you've got to hold on to being the curious one and be the one to ask questions and understand how people think and understand what that's like for them um, and be able to ask the right questions, I think is the best thing that you can do when you're in, a posi in one of those positions. Um, you find that you get a lot of information that things are happening that you wouldn't have known of otherwise. Um, and that can be very hard to do, right? Being in a, in a leadership position can be very stressful and it can sometimes be very lonely. Yeah. And so maintaining your own curiosity and always being able to ask the question, um, it, it, I think is the best advice I could give to anybody in that position. Absolutely. And I think that that's a great place to start to, to wrap us up today. I, I think we could go on this for another two hours really easily. At least. Uh, yeah. And, and we'll, we'll revisit this topic, I'm sure, plenty of times because uh, the re-experiencing, the re-traumatization is it is something core to the trauma-informed lens, and, and it helps us gain that deeper understanding. I'd sort of like to, to, to wrap up on a note, if I could, of, you know, how is this impacting maybe us? Um, I, I wrote a blog post a couple weeks ago of, I'm not sleeping well anymore. Like, and I'm not a guy that's always slept well anyway, but I, I find that a lot of the stuff, and I've stopped watching as much news, but I feel like I, you know, with healthcare in the news, with, you know, housing cuts in the news, like I have to professionally stay somewhat engaged. I just can't hide in the corner um, and ignore that it's not existing. Um, but this is impacting us. And if you just think about the things that, that have happened in the last few weeks, uh, for people of, I, I think, all of our ages, the fact nuclear war is potentially back in the news. Um, you know, we've got shootings, we, we've got this, the sexual harassment stuff coming out. And, and I always, when, when times sort of get hard like this, and a lot of these things hit close to home, even if you've not experienced this, um, you know, we're, we're working with people that, that have, the, have been vulnerable to these things and affected by them, that, that just think about the foundations of your own self-care. Um, I, I usually go back, you know, sleep, exercise, eat well. Those are usually things we can try to do. If you, I'm, I didn't sleep well last night. I, I, I think it was like going to bed. I knew there were shootings going on in our community. Um, so I got to exercise today. I've got to eat well today. Um, and I already practiced mindfulness this morning. So, well, I'm not going to get an A plus today because I only got like three hours of sleep. I, I'm going to try to make some extra credit up uh, during the day and practice some Tai Chi uh, that I'm working on as well. So, I just think it's a reminder that, that this, even if we've not experienced some of this directly, we carry around a lot of the trauma of the folks that we work with, and this can trigger a lot of that as well. So again, always when, when times get rough, focus on those basics of self-care. Make sure you're taking care of yourself because if we don't take care of ourselves, it's going to be nearly impossible to help others that, that look for us for hope and healing. So um, great episode, guys. Uh, really appreciate this. Again, I think a lot of uh, topics to move forward with as well. And I want to thank our audience uh, for hanging in us. We would love to hear your opinions about this too, because I don't think, you know, we're, we're not the only three experts and the only three people experiencing this. So please, traumainformlens.org, there's a comment section. We would, we would love to hear from you and any suggestions that you might have. So Thank you. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And uh, we will see you next week for an another episode. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye.